Okay. So you ready for this one? Um, this one was asked by a guy that I communicate with. Never met him face to face, but I've communicated with him. He's from Australia, and he asked this question. Hi, brother. I hope you're doing well. I wanted to send you a question for the APT series. From my limited experience with Western churches, it seems, now, now, just everybody think. Lawrence, are you thinking? <laughs> okay. I, I, I keep saying this, but this is, this is absolutely critical. That we consider the question. You really want to put your thinking caps on when it comes to the questions themselves. Like you want to just ask yourself, is it a valid question? Are they making assumptions that we actually haven't proved? Uh, or, or might even, you can think of places in Scripture that actually might disprove it. But So here's, here's his question. From my limited experience with Western churches, I can't really question that. That's his experience, and he's saying he's got limited experience. It seems that most churches... Now, this is from his limited experience. He's making this observation. Now, this observation might be right or it might be wrong. He says, it seems that most churches decide on elders and deacons with a majority vote of members. So, whether that's true in most Western churches or not, uh, I guess would have to be determined outside of his observation because he's admitting that his experience is limited. But in his experience, that's what he's seen. And maybe we could just, you know, ask, what is our experience? I mean, basically in the churches that we've been a part of, I can say this, that... The two churches that I've been members of in Texas that we did indeed uh, choose elders and deacons by way of vote. But I know of other churches, a number of other churches, that do not do that. But that's my experience. But so here's, here's what he goes on to say. Even a secret vote is counted... And if there is a majority, then the elder or the deacon is accepted, later on ordained. And then again, he puts in, in uh, parentheses, my assumption. If my assumption is correct, why do churches choose elders or deacons that way? In other words, the majority vote either 50% or 75%, etc. He's recognizing that different churches require different percentage of majority in order to pass the vote. It seems to me that even if one brother or sister opposes the calling or the ordination of an elder or deacon, that's a serious thing that should not be ignored or lost in a majority vote. So you see where his concern is coming from. In his experience, he sees that elders and deacons are typically chosen by congregational vote, and typically that vote is not going to be 100%. Most churches are either going to go for perhaps a 51%, just over 50%, over, you know, a majority, or they may determine 75%, or they may determine 90%. And um, he's concerned that even if you do like 90%, well, there's 10% people, perhaps, that aren't in agreement. And even if that 10% was made up of one brother or sister who was opposing isn't that a serious thing that should not be ignored or just simply lost in the majority vote? And then he's going to give an example, which I just did. But 
um, let's hear his. If a church decides that they will choose elders or deacons with a 90% majority vote and an elder deacon gets 95% of the vote, he will be chosen. But there's still 5% of the church who thinks he should not be an elder or deacon. That's a big deal, assuming this church votes biblically and does not follow preferences as if they were choosing a mere politician. I mean, 5% of the church thinks he should not be an elder or deacon. It seems to me that is something to be addressed and not ignored with an anonymous vote that is forgotten after being counted. Now, he is assuming that it's an anonymous vote. I've seen where there is an anonymous vote on things, and I've seen where everybody is supposed to put their name on the actual ballot. I've also known of situations where people were asked to put their names on the ballots, but if they wished to remain anonymous, they could. My understanding, this is him again, my understanding is that the only reason an elder or deacon should be an elder deacon is that they're called by the Lord and meet the biblical standards. If a spirit-led brother or sister in his or her God-given discernment votes against them, that's a big thing to me. They may have a biblical reason why they should not be ordained. Should Now here comes the question. Should not the church care about that? Even more, should not elders and deacons be chosen with a 100% vote? Or better, only when there are no biblical objections to the candidates who have been put forward by the advice of the already recognized elders. The congregation follows the advice of the elders or opposes it only if there are biblical reasons. So in the end, only fully congregationally approved elders, deacons will be ordained. I hope that makes sense, and more than that, that if the Lord leads you to answer this, there may be light and truth according to the Scriptures. And that is my objection to answer according to the Scriptures. So, um, I guess... I guess I throw this at at you all. Is is are, are his questions good, valid? Are his assumptions good, right? Are his concerns genuine? Um, what do you think? Based on your present knowledge and present understanding, what what sort of observations do you have? Isn't that a good question to start with, right? Yeah. How did the early church do it? What's that? Well, let me let me show you some things. Let's go to the book of Acts. Yeah, but let's let's actually start even before Acts chapter six. You know, you do know that of course Judas was eliminated and eradicated from the apostleship, but then he was replaced. And when you go to Acts chapter 1, verse 12. It's like some people ask him for a biblical question. That would be impossible. So people can draw it on Zoom. People can't draw the question. You can't hear the question. Yeah, like, what, what Louise asked. Not that one again. Oh. Just what Louise asked. Like if Louise you... asked how the early church did it. And that's, a, that's exactly what we should be asking. We should be, see, here's the thing. How does, what, this, you want to all catch this. How does God teach us? By direct commandment, there are things we are specifically told to do. But that's not the only way. We also have example 
Now, example is not always as firm as a commandment because sometimes an example, you know, just because Samson did some of the things Samson did doesn't make them right. Just because he was a godly man. And, and, and so example by itself has to be measured. We have to be a little bit cautious. But God can and often does teach us by way of example. Obviously, the example of Jesus is right and perfect all the time. And Paul could say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so imitating, uh, obviously God has recorded what he's recorded. And imitation is very much something that God has designed into all of that. I mean, you, you can think of just uh, Hebrews chapter 13, where it says we should imitate those that uh, imitate the faith of our leaders. Uh, that's that's uh, Hebrews 13, 7. So, uh, oh, and, the, and then... And then we can also learn by principle. So you have direct commandment, you have example, but you also have principle. You say, what do you mean by principle? I mean this. If God says something like that, by principle I mean something that can be deduced. For instance, if God says that we should submit ourselves to those that have the oversight over us, there are things implied in that statement. Like one, you need to be in the place where such leadership is found. Where is it found? Well, it's not found out in the workplace. It's not found just kind of hovering over there in the marketplace somewhere. It's found in the church, which that, that see, there's an assumption built into that, that you are going to be in that place where that leadership is. And so there's a lot of times we can... Uh, very naturally and very, very truthfully deduce from something that God tells us uh, other truths. And so you want to remember that God, God teaches in these different ways. And so example, example is where we're going to go right now. We don't, let me just say this, we simply do not have any New Testament commandment on the process of choosing elders and deacons. All we have is example. There is no commandment. Now, there are commandments with regards to the qualifications, but there are none with regards to the methodology. And so what I want to do is I want to show you the examples that we have. So, Acts chapter 1. Now, I recognize... And you, the question has to do with elders and deacons. The truth is that the apostles were leaders in the early church. And you've got apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Uh, Peter himself could say that he was an elder. So, you know, you. I, I don't think we're going too far out on the limb here to bring in apostles. I know they're a special category, but here we are, verse 12 of chapter 1 of Acts. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they'd entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with women and Mary and mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. And he said, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now, this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness. Falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all of his bowels gushed out. It became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so the field was called in their own language a caldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of the Psalms, May his camp become desolate, let there be no one to dwell in it, let another take his office. See, they saw that. 
let another take his office and the Spirit of God has opened their eyes that you know there's there's a reality here that this needs to be fulfilled. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. So you see the qualifications are being set forth here. Beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. They put forward two. Joseph called Barsabbas, who is also called Justice, and Matthias. Now, are these the only two men? We're not really told the details. We see the qualifications. They had to have accompanied the other apostles all the time. But the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. So they had to be there all the way from the baptism of John until the day when Christ was taken up. So you see the span. They wanted somebody who was a personal witness all the way from John's ministry all the way to the ascension. That was key. Now, were there only two men? We're not told. All we know is that two men were set forth. It's very interesting. Not just one man was set forth. Two men were set forth. And it seems like they're in a, they're in a pickle here. They're in a quandary. They don't know which one. And so they prayed, and they said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. They cast lots for them. The lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So, what do you all feel about that? Should we be casting lots to determine leadership in the church? No, 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 that's not my question. What's my question? My question is, should we be casting lots for leadership in the church? Is that the only place in the Bible where lots are cast? Do you know anybody in history that made decisions by casting lots? Well, yes, but I'm talking post-apostolic times, like somewhat recently, like, like in the last few hundred years. Have you, do you know? Wesley was a lot caster. And that didn't always prove to be a good choice on his part. But anyways, but he was a lot caster. And you know where he got that from? You know who else were as a people, a group of people that were lot casters? The Moravians. And of course, Wesley was influenced by the Moravians. The Moravians were a whole group. They, they basically, these are folks that came out of Eastern Europe, out of the, like what's present-day Czech Republic. They migrated into, into modern-day Germany, and uh, Count Zinzendorf basically sheltered these people. They became a very evangelistic group. But if you look at, at even the selection of the very first missionaries that they sent out, which went to the Caribbean, St. Thomas, I believe, they cast lots to determine. Now, I don't even know what casting a lot is. They called it that, what exactly that was and what exactly that looked like. We don't actually know, but they must have developed something. And obviously, obviously, uh, you know, the proverb talks about the casting of the lot. We know that God controls that. And there have been people of God that have, you know, even in deciding which person is going to become a missionary. And so, you know, that that is, whether they actually did it for elders and deacons, I don't know. I, I don't know enough about them. I just, I, I am aware that they did it at that point. So, here's an example. Now here's another one. Let's go to Acts 6, like Lawrence and Abed have suggested we should. Now, the thing about Acts chapter 6 is it doesn't specifically say that this is deacons. 
it for certain is not elders. It for certain is not apostles. It for certain is not missionaries. This has to do with somebody that is being chosen to serve. Now, I'll say this. Even though the noun form that we get deacon from is not used here, the verbal form is used. The verb for serve, which is the, you know, the, the, the noun is one who serves. That's what a deacon means. A deacon is a servant. Many churches, especially in this country, many in the U.S., deacons need to understand their position. They are not called to be elders. I find in many churches and in this country, you get these deacons who are both deacon and trustee, and they don't submit themselves to the eldership. They basically run the churches. That happens in, the, in many Baptist churches in the United States, too. You basically have uh, deacons that are running the show. That is, that is not the biblical pattern. Deacons are servants. Now, that's what the men in Acts 6 are being <coughs> selected to do, to serve, to, to verbally be deacons. And so, in, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews, because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. The twelve, now here's the apostles, including Matthias, who just got picked. Twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now, by the way, it's not just apostles who should not be serving tables, who should be giving themselves to preaching the word. It's obviously pastors. And this is, I'm not making any, look, it's okay for a pastor to mow the church lawn. It's okay for a pastor to, to work on the church building. But the point is, is this. These men recognized that of all the duties that potentially were at their disposal. Could they have served the tables of widows? They could have served the tables of widows, but they recognize this. We should not be doing that. God has given us a calling to something different. And they said, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. So you see what the issue is. They need somebody to serve tables because the, the Hellenistic widows are not being properly ministered to. Therefore, now notice this. There's going to be another selection here. This time it's not by lots. Notice, notice what, the dis, what the actual apostles say. This is the church at Jerusalem. Remember where we're at. This is a church setting. It's the Hellenistic widows in this church that are failing to be ministered to properly. The need comes to the attention of the apostles. The apostles are in control. The apostles are overseeing the situation. But notice what they say. They don't say, well, we're apostles, so we're going to take it upon ourselves to pick the seven most qualified men. No. Look at verse 3. Brothers, and by the way, that's brethren, that's brothers and sisters, that's men and women Christians, looking to the brethren. You pick out, and I'm adding the you, but it's pick out. They're, who? The, the brethren. Pick out from among you seven men of good repute. Now again, the qualifications are laid down. We never want to forget qualifications, no matter what we're talking about, whether it's apostle, whether it's pastor, whether it's a missionary, whether, whether it's a deacon. <coughs> Pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. You notice one thing about men being selected to serve tables. It's not just pick the guy who happens to work at the corner restaurant. It's not just pick the guy who can wield a hammer and a screwdriver. 
It's actually the spiritual qualifications are more important than any kind of physical qualifications. And you know what? We always need to remember that when we're picking deacons. Deacons primarily need to be men of spiritual caliber. And notice this, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. You know what? God designs different members in the body differently. The eyes different than the foot. The hands different from the ears. And, and this is just a reality. And these guys are recognizing what God has called them to do. And so they're going to devote themselves to prayer and ministry of the word. Some people might say, you know, Oh, the guy's sitting in front of his Bible all the time and he's out there walking in the fields praying. Yeah, that's exactly what God's called. You want pastors who pray. You want pastors who have their nose in the scriptures. Well, and these are apostles I recognize, but they're, you know, the same thing is true of men that are called to oversee the church. And what they said pleased the whole gathering and they. And who's they? Well, the verse 3, it's the brothers, the brethren, the brothers and sisters. They chose Stephen, man full of faith of the Holy Spirit. They chose Philip. They chose Procurus. They chose Nicanor, Timon, Parm Parmenas, Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And these they set before the apostles. Isn't this interesting? The apostles said, choose seven men. The people chose the seven. Once they had chosen the seven, then they set them before the apostles. And the apostles, you see, prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Okay, so, so now you got that account. So let's go to another one. Let's go to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. So, now here, what we have is Paul and Barnabas, they're traveling around. We know that they, uh, in verse 1, they're at Iconium, and then in verse 8, now at Lystra. And so, you know, they're, they're moving around. Verse 19, Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. Having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul. That's where he got stoned. Uh, verse 24, they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. When they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. They sailed to Antioch. And so you see, I mean, basically they're, they're moving around here. They're preaching the gospel. Uh, verse 21, chapter 14. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Notice this. When and when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Now let me ask you something about that. Do you get a really clear sense in verse 23 about who's appointing elders? Who does it sound like is appointing elders? Does it sound like the people in the churches are appointing elders, or does it sound like Paul and Barnabas are appointing elders? So verse 21. Verse 20. When the disciples gathered about him, he rose up, entered the city. Next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city, that obviously is Paul and Barnabas, and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when 
they had appointed elders for them. Now, does what is yours? What 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 does yours say in verse twenty three? When they ordained them, and the them is very interesting. In every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Well, the them, the second them, clearly is the people in the church. Now, here's the thing. If, I'm wondering if I, okay, yes. The Bauer Danker Art and Gingrich Greek lexicon is considered one of the one of the scholarly lexicons. The word here appointed the the BDAG uh, lexicon says it means to stretch out the hand in voting. Now, I've come across that meaning before. And I think you can find that definition in, in, in various lexicons. Now, it's not a word that's used much. But it does seem somewhere, and a lot of times they look in extra biblical sources to try to figure out when a word is only used once or twice in the whole Bible, and they're really looking for a contemporary meaning, they will oftentimes go into you know, the Greek-Roman society and look for places where the word was used. And uh, it, basically, the word can have a meaning that a choice was made by the show of hands. Now, it, but here's the thing. I mean, if, if we just look at the time frame, where did they appoint elders? It says in every church with prayer and fasting. Now, you know what we're not actually told is how long the churches existed. We see Paul and Barnabas, they go in there, they're preaching the gospel. But you know, isn't one of the qualifications not a novice? Sometimes I have heard that that it is very likely that what happened in these early churches is that when the gospel went out into these various places, what was one of the first things Paul typically did when he went into a city? He went to the synagogue. And it seems like probably what happened, you preach in the synagogue, some of the Jews were saved. You preach to the, to the pagan, uh, the Gentiles, some of those are some of those folks are saved. Clearly, we see churches like the church at Rome, where you had a you had a Jewish contingent, you had the, you had the Gentile contingent there, and they were interacting together. Well, one of the things that that it it's very likely is that you had Jews within the synagogue who were true Jews. I mean, they were looking. You know, it's kind of like Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Weren't they looking for the kingdom of God? They were. And they were searching. And it may be that you had God's people. They, they already were walking with the Lord. Now, they're, they're suddenly coming to, to new truth, and they're embracing it. But you know, if you've got a fairly new church, but you've got somebody that's been walking with the Lord for years. Now, yes, he's come to new expressions of truth through the preaching of Paul. But he knows his Old Testament. He's very, very affluent and, or very, uh, very educated, very, very knowledgeable to the, with the Old Testament scriptures, which most of these Jews would have been. You can imagine that these guys would have been in a position to, especially if all of a sudden, all, you know, all the lights go on and now they see the Old Testament scriptures for what they are. And they can teach just like Paul can. They, you know, wow, we see it now. We see Isaiah 53. We see what that is. You can imagine that these guys might not have been novices to be thrown into that position right away. Now, whether or not you, 
you know, whether or not you um, want to take this word, which can mean a vote by a show of hands. Well, I would just say this. The way they chose, if you want to call what, what the men that were chosen, the seven men that were chosen in Acts chapter 6, it seems like they were deacons. They weren't directly called deacons, but they were being chosen to serve. They were being chosen to do the work of a deacon. And how were they chosen? Well, they were obviously, brethren, look out among yourselves. Well, how does that happen? How do, how do you do that? Brethren, look out among yourselves. How do you do that? How, you know what? Something had to happen that we are not explicitly told about. And if we're not explicitly told, that means that God didn't think it was that important to tell us. Like, okay, what if I told Grace Fellowship Manchester, we need another deacon? Because that's what happened. The leaders, the overseers, they were elders in that, or they were apostles in that day in the church at Jerusalem. But you know what? They looked, they saw the need. The need had been brought to them. Hellenistic widows, they needed to be ministered to. They looked out, they assessed the whole situation. They said, you know what? We think we need seven men. They made that decision. We need seven. Was that arbitrary? No, it probably had to do with they sized up the need. So what if I sized up the need and I said, you know what? We need one man or we need two men. And I say, brethren, look out among yourselves. Something's got to happen. What's going to happen? Okay, you're going to get together. Now, if you get together and you're looking for what? So when you get together and you begin to talk about who we're going to, remember what happened. They set these seven men before the apostles and the apostles obviously approved of it and they laid their hands on them. And eventually, between them, we'll, you know, agree on seven. That's why I kind of picture it as you So, the word is expressing what's going to happen. But, are you going to vote? You need to get a majority of that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, okay. Let's say, let's say, let's say, you you all get together. So I've told you, we need two men, and you all get together, and somebody says, "Well, I think Thomas," and somebody's like, "Well, I saw the way Thomas treated his son the other day. I don't really like that," and somebody else maybe is in the same. The, the same line of work, and he's kind of got jealousies with Thomas, and he's not overly prone to that. But most everybody, yeah, we like Thomas. Somebody else says, well, I like Ellen pipes up and says, I like Sharif. Well, you're only saying that because he's your husband. Well, yeah, but I see how he is, and he's a good guy, and he's full of the Spirit sometimes. And so... <laughs> as as you guys are as you guys are seeking to wrestle through it, and, and now here's the thing, brethren, look out among yourselves. Are you gonna let little girls make the decision? What about that guy that visited on? Sunday that rode his bike from Liverpool. You know, let him make the decision? Why not? On what criteria are you going to limit him? But if he says, hey, I'm a Christian, and I decided this is my church. What if that guy back there says, well, I've been coming here two years. But I really wrestle with whether I'm a Christian or not. You're going to choose him? 
what if these what if this couple over here they've been coming for two years but you know we have had thoughts about the fact that they might need to be disciplined let me ask you this are there times when God's people are carnal do you think the Corinthians were in a good place when Paul says, I can't even deal with you as though you're mature, you guys are carnal. You guys are suing each other. Do you think Christians that are suing each other are in a good place to determine who the, who the new elder ought to be? Is it possible that you can be in a place like the Galatians? Oh, foolish Galatians. Can it be possible that your arms are hanging down like the Hebrews? Is it possible that there can be tares among the wheat? See, one of the problems that, that is being presented by the question is it's almost like there is this assumption that, okay, we have a body of very spiritual believers and we're able to identify all of them and put all the people that don't fit in that category on the outside and they don't get to vote. One of the reasons, okay, what we have to rec what I re what I have recognized is this: when we started Grace in San Antonio, I did not run right out and say, "Well, how do Reformed Baptist churches do it, and how do how have churches historically done it?" Now I'm interested in that. I am interested in how they do it. But you know where I went? I went to these passages, and I and I asked this: okay, something happened there. Titus. You know what Paul sent Titus to do? He said, Titus, go to the churches in Crete and do what? Appoint elders. You know what that tells me? I have a feeling that here, in these areas of Lyconium and Lystra, as well as in Crete, I have a feeling that churches started. Much like what? Much like the church at Colossae. Epaphras, he starts preaching the gospel. Paul goes into Philippi, starts preaching the gospel, gets thrown in jail, gets out of jail. When Paul left, there's absolutely no reason to believe that there were elders there. Who was in Philippi when Paul left? The first time. Who? There was the Philippian jailer and his family, Lydia and her family. Now, Paul cast the demon out of the demon-possessed girl. There's no indication that she was converted. She might have been, but there's no indication. So basically you had a handful of converts, maybe primarily make, made up of two families. And he hit the road. But you know what? By the time you come over to the Philippian letter, it's written to the overseers and deacons. Some point in time, I think what happened was very often the churches started and then they came back through. Either the apostle came back through or they sent apostolic helpers like Tychicus or Onesimus or Epaphras or Barnabas or Silas or Timothy or Titus. These guys were being, there's a lot of guys that were being sent around and they were doing different things. But Titus, Titus, go in there and select, appoint elders in every church. That kind of gives you the idea that they didn't have any because if they had some, all Paul has to do is write the churches in Crete and tell the elders to pick. But Titus, go do it. Now, maybe they were, whatever, maybe they did have elders. Maybe they needed help. It seems to indicate, I would take it that they didn't have elders. But here's the thing. Paul gave Titus qualifications. Paul gave Timothy. Timothy was another guy that was moving around. He happened to be in, in Ephesus when 1 Timothy was written. He's given the qualifications for elders and deacons. Titus, go to Crete. He's given the qualifications. Well, see, if these guys are coming from the outside, how do they know who's qualified? What are you going to do? You see, again, there's silence. 
But you got to think, if Titus goes into the churches in Crete and he's got this list of qualifications, well, he has no idea who's qualified. What, so what's he going to do? Yeah, he's going to ask the people. Here's the qualifications. Who's qualified? And so what, what I recognize is this. We've got to do this somehow. And the details are just simply missing in Scripture. And so if we say, well, how could we do it? We could do it this way. We could say, well, um, the elders are going to pick. And some people would say, well, what if there are no elders? Well, some people would say, well, then leadership of other churches needs to need to pick. It's like, but how do you determine all that? How, how are these choices made? Well, we can come down to this. Is there ample room in Scripture to think that the congregation ought to be involved? And I would say, absolutely. On what basis? One, when deacons were picked, they looked to the brethren. Two, the word in Acts 14 can definitely mean selection by a show of hands. Now, also Titus is not going to go in and figure out who has those qualifications unless he's interacting with the people. So, my point, my, my thinking is this. I want the feedback from a church. Now, somebody could say, well, the way I'm going to get the feedback, let's say I'm an elder, and we're looking at maybe choosing new elders, and I say, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go sit down with every single family in the church. Well, again, you have to decide who's that going to be. I mean, it's, if you have a membership, well, then you might say, I'm going to speak to everybody that's a member. If you don't have a membership, well, who are you going to talk to? If you say, I'm going to talk to pretty much everybody that comes to the church, whether they visit regularly or irregularly, or and, and I will basically decipher, based on my pastoral knowledge, how much their opinion on this weighs out. If I think they're carnal, well, their opinion's going to be lower. If I think that they, you know, lack assurance or, or they're fighting with their wife all the time or, or they're, you know, they've come over from Liverpool and who knows whether they're devoted, you know, okay, then I'll give everything, you know, I'll, I'll make mental notes of how much I think that their, their input ought to be viable and credible in all of this. Or we say, well, we have a membership, and if you have basically given your testimony, and we have good feel as a church that your, your testimony is, is uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a credible testimony, and, and we've watched your life, and you've walked with us, and you're a member of the church. And so we say, well, the brethren are those that have shared their testimony, and they are devoted to this church, and they're one of us. And um, yes, yeah, some people have greater assurance, some people have lesser assurance. And so we can do that. But see, what I'm getting at in all of this is the Bible doesn't give us exact details. And so I realize real life. I realize that if you have five people in a church, you know, I realize if, if, if you went to Philippi and you said to basically a couple handfuls of people, what do you think? Well, if somebody says, well, yeah, there's this Jewish brother over here and he really knows the scriptures and, you know, he's, he's able to speak to us very profoundly from the Old Testament and he's probably been saved and walking with the Lord and he's been one of God's people and, and living as a, in the synagogue over here and he's, he's a real, he's a true Jew. He's one inwardly and outwardly and 
yeah, yeah, okay, if you got five people making the decision, that might be easy. But you know what I've found over the years is, okay, multiply that church to 50, multiply that church to 500. You know, the more people you have, the more likely you are not going to get 100% consensus. In fact, if you wait for 100% consensus, <coughs> I will just about guarantee you, you will stagnate. You will never do anything. You will never have any more elders, any more deacons. You will never be able to make any sort of decisions. Why? Because you always have somebody in the church. There, there is always going to be tears in the church, for one. You cannot, I, I don't care how closely you police a church membership, how closely you examine people. Look, the. When they said, when Jesus said, one of you is going to turn on me, one of you is going to betray me, they didn't all of a sudden all jump and say, it's Judas! They all suspected themselves before they suspected him. What does that tell you? That tells you that, I mean, what is what do you think is one of the main reasons why Jesus doesn't want us to be tear sniffers? Yes, because he knows full well we're going to get it wrong. That's why he doesn't want us trying to get all the, all the tears out of the church because we sure enough are going to tear out the wheat with the tares. We are not capable of discerning this. And so... You know what? Demises are in our midst. And, and Judases are in our midst. And if we're going to seek to, to make some decisions and make them in, a, in as biblical a manner as possible, trying to uh, <clears throat> really get a sense of the Lord, I'll tell you this. I am absolutely, I, I am absolutely comfortable with having the church pray, having the church seek the Lord, and then taking a vote. And one of the reasons, even though I am all about elder rule in the church, there are certain decisions I want the church to be involved in making the decision about. And I, I can see the apostles were of the same mindset. Could they have chosen the seven men? Certainly they could have. But they wanted the church involved. Why? I'll tell you, there's, there's various reasons. But one thing is this. You know what? People tend to put their best foot forward when they're in front of the, I, I might say, in front of the pastor. Can you imagine being in front of an apostle? It's like, you know, Peter realizes people act a little bit different around me. You all, you know, they, they pick up the questionable magazines when they know I'm coming over to visit. And, but you guys, you guys are going to have a better feel. So that's one reason why I like that approach. But also, I've never wanted to be in the position where Let's say somebody comes to Grace Fellowship and they're like, hey, I've, I, I've been here long enough. I, I want to be a part of this church. I want to be dedicated to this church. I want to be one of them. I see the leadership. I see Tim leading. I'll follow him. I'll submit to him. You know what I don't want to have happen is I don't want to step in and now that that person is committed to the church, to say to them, okay, now I'm going to put a guy into the eldership without consulting you that you have to submit to. I don't want to do, I want the church, I want, I want to hear their voice. I really believe that God does not just speak through the leadership, that he speaks through the church. I have seen so much unity over there. And that's another thing. I really desire unity. And I think one of the best ways that you're going to accomplish unity is to get the, the feedback from the church. And I think you teach through the qualifications. I think you have a time of prayer and fasting. You really want to seek the Lord. The Lord Jesus himself, the night before he chose the, the 12, 
I mean, he spent the night in prayer, really seeking the Lord. I think we need to do that. We need to ask God for, for unity. But I am, I am totally okay. And quite honestly, I am not so concerned about the one or two or the five percent of people that, in in my opinion, a ninety five percent approval is great. Like that expresses God's will. Now I've had hundred percent. I got a hundred percent. John Seitzma uh, received a hundred percent. We have never had any elder at GCC receive below, I think, 92%. And uh, yeah, quite honestly, I think that's phenomenal. I, I am not, I, I think that that is such, such a confirmation of God's will. And you say, well, what if one of those people, you know, like the question that came up, what if, what if one of those people is really godly? Is their, is their concern just lost in the pile? Well, I would say this, that no, no, it's not. And what you don't do, I, I mean, when, when it's come to choosing elders and deacons, I just don't simply teach on it and then hand everybody ballots and then count them. That's not what... No, you teach on the qualifications, but then you also give the church opportunity to question the guy. You tell the church, if you have any concerns, bring them to me or to whatever the present eldership is. Bring your concerns. And so you basically gave the person an opportunity because it can be that one person in a church does know something that's disqualifying. That can happen. And so if that gets brought, well then what you don't want is that person just to vote no, but never divulge what the concern is. So you're going to give them every opportunity to bring it forward. So, so basically, if you get 95% and 5% of the church, you know, say you got a thousand people and you got <clears throat> you got 5%, you got 50 people that that don't vote for this guy. Well, why are they out of tune with everybody else? I mean, I think you need to give place for that. It may be that they haven't really thought about it. It may be that they don't really know the person. Um, it's, it's very interesting to me. I'll tell you this. After I, over the years, when we would take votes, I personally would tally up the votes and I would look at the names and I would see the people who voted no. <clears throat> and I usually would ask them, why did you vote no? And you know, oftentimes I found that the reasons just weren't valid. Like they, they were crazy reasons sometimes. And so, sometimes it was like, well, I just, I, I didn't know him. I, did, I didn't feel like I could vote yes because I just, I didn't know him. And that you'll get someone else that'll say that. Now, I didn't know him, but because you elders set him forth, I just, I went, I went with it. But, um, you know, you get, I've heard, I've heard different reasons over the years, but I think, I think what has to happen is you have to recognize that all the details are not given in scripture. And so what we do is we have to come up with some method. Typically what I have done. My method has been this. When it comes to elders, the existing elders are going to recommend a man or two men or three men or whatever it is. We are going to determine first before God whether we think they're qualified. Only then will we bring that man and say, church, we want you to consider this brother or these brothers for the eldership, men who you will need to submit to, men who will have the spiritual responsibility of the oversight. What you need to determine is the Spirit of God making this man or these men overseers over your souls. You need to determine that. Now, here's the qualifications. <clears throat> you preach through it. 
make sure that the church has been taught. And then you give the guy some opportunity to answer questions publicly. Let the church ask him hard questions. Ask him questions about his life. Ask him questions about his doctrine. Let it be public. Tell the church, if you have any concerns at all, bring them to me. Um, if you have any concerns at all that you want to take to that individual, take them to him. You give the church ample opportunity to bring any concerns to him or to the other elders. And then you actually have the vote. And typically, I would not go below 90%. Quite honestly, I... I I don't think 75% is high enough. I would hate to be a guy that that I know one out of four people in the church are not supportive of me. I would I, I thought to me that's too much. 90 has uh, has always been I believe a a good number. You say, well, is that just random? Is that just you? Well, it's got to be some number. If you're going to do a vote, you got to have some number. And I just think if you make it 100%, you're never you're never going to have anybody. You'll never have a new elder. Even if the church only has 100 people in it or 50 people in it, if you want 100, percent it's just you, you got to make it so that it's actually going to be reasonably functional, like you're actually going to be able to accomplish something. With deacons, I've done it different. You say why? Well, because based on the example in Acts chapter six, I believe that there is a place for me to say, church, I want to deacons. And then, you see, it's one thing when, when you set a person. If you set an individual before the church, then they're all looking at him. They're examining him. If you say, I want seven men, now all of a sudden, everybody's looking at everybody. Now you are much less likely to get 100%. Because you just have people all over the place. And even though you could teach through the qualifications, somebody will say, oh, I didn't even think of that guy. Because they're just thinking about everybody. And I, I can, again, I've seen crazy things over the years. Some, pe some people in the church are very discerning, and some people are not as discerning. And I, there's been crazy things that have happened. I've seen it happen. But I want to be in the place with deacons where I can do like they did in Acts chapter 6, where I can say to the church, Church, I see a present need. We need two men. And so basically I'm going to hand ballots to you. And I, what, basically the way I have done it is put the name of everyone you think is qualified. Now, even though I'm looking for two, you can put ten names if you think there's ten men qualified to be deacons. As I say, we've taught through the qualifications. I want, and if you don't think there's any men qualified, put don't put any name. Just put your name so I'll know whose, whose ballot it is. But if you think there's one guy, put it. If you think there's two guys, put it. If you think there's ten guys, put it. And then what I do in the end is I tally them all up, and the two guys that had the highest percentage are the two new deacons. That's the way I've done that. And actually, when I've done that before, I've seen, wow, when I looked at all the data, it was like, I, I think there was a time I asked for two, and when I did all the data, there were three guys that were neck and neck, and everybody <coughs> was a mile away. And they just said, well, I would take that to mean it's God's will for us to have three. And so that's what we did. That's basically how I've done it. And, you know, somebody can always find fault with that. But I just recognize this. I have examples, no, no commandments. I have examples. And as I try to take from all of them and glean from all of them, that's the way that I... That, that I settled on, and it's worked. It's worked. I'm not saying that there aren't other ways that work, but that's that's the way I instituted it at GCC, and I, you know, I, I don't know whether they've actually, I don't think since I've left they've actually had a vote for either, so I don't know 
you know, that, that obviously could be up for change if the guys that are there leading now decide to change it. So anyway, what, what say you all? There's a question in the chat. What is that question? Um, what about of removing a deacon or an elder? Is the deacon an elder position for life? Are deacons, now let me just say this, some churches re-elect, they, they vote on elders and deacons every so often. And I, I guess I can understand why a church might do that. It probably makes the removal of an elder or deacon much easier when you do it that way? I'll just say this. It takes the pressure off the existing eldership to do it that way because it puts the responsibility onto the, the church rather than on their own shoulders. But, you know, the problem with that is that there's um, we just simply don't have anything in Scripture that would lead us to believe that that we need to be choosing elders and deacons repeatedly. Now, I, I'm not going to say that if a church decided that's the way they want to do it. I, I mean, there's nothing that forbids them from doing that scripturally. I just think this. I think that we need a church that's going to be faithful. You know, Andy Hamilton said that when he was in the Far East, he just came across churches that were not capable of being honest with the people. And he said they would have somebody preach, and the guy's preaching was awful. And yet, because they're, they were in a society there where everybody had to save face, they'd say, oh, brother, you know, wonderful message when they all knew it was horrible. But in that society, you get that Oriental society, if you cause somebody to lose face, then you yourself lose face. Well, it's not only Oriental. I mean, we tend to not like to have to do hard things. We tend to not like to have to confront people. We tend to not want to have to say difficult things to people. But listen, if we're going to be faithful, faithful to God's church, then we often have to do some difficult things. We at GCC in San Antonio, we did not vote every year or every two years or every five years, re-vote elders and deacons in. But I can tell you this, we removed an elder and we removed a deacon, and both were extremely difficult, but it needed to be done for the sake of the church. And, you know, I, th I think that that's where uh, we, have to, we have to be responsible. And you know what? If there's only one elder, there can be times when the church you know, one of the things you see in 1 Timothy chapter 5 is that it seems, it seems what's being stated there is that if you have an elder who continues, who persists in sin, that he's basically called out. You know the text I mean? It's found in 1 Timothy chapter 5. There's a reason I'm going to this. I mean, there's some application. But 1 Timothy 5, it says, verse 17, 
Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Labor deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against an elder. You see the situation? Don't admit a charge against an elder. Not ever. Except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. Now, verse 20 may be speaking generically about anybody in the church, but in the context, it sounds like it has to, I mean, verse 17 and 18 and 19 all have to do with elders. And it, it seems that verse 20 may very well deal with elders too. As for those elders who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, that the rest may stand in fear. And you see, it's right in the context of admitting a charge against an elder. And so, is there a time to admit an, a charge against an elder? Well, there is. Now, you want to do it in the proper way. There needs to be two or three. You know what? You, we don't want to be a church where one person is allowed to bring accusations against an elder. That's a, that's a dangerous situation. And again, it's kind of like the one person who you're afraid is godly, but they voted and they voted no and everybody else voted yes. Well, it's, see, it's the same kind of situation. You don't want to give total voice and authority to one individual because, because it's too easy for people to make charges against leaders. And you know, the devil is a slander. And when you get tears in the church, you just it opens it itself up for all sorts of situations. But my point in all of this is there is a place to bring a charge against an elder. There is a place for the church to say, you are persisting in sin and we're calling it out publicly that the rest may fear. And there, there can be a place where the church says, you can't lead us anymore. You're not qualified anymore. I mean, there does come a place where if you persist in sin long enough, that you, then you have to actually have to ask the question whether... You see, the thing about the qualifications, the qualifications for even when it says blameless, blameless doesn't mean sinless. But there does come a point when a person persists in sin long enough that their blamelessness is now in question. And where the church needs to say, you can't be our pastor anymore. And so, if you have a plurality of elders, you're really hoping that those elders are not just protecting each other, but that their primary responsibility is to protect the church. And so if they see that one of their fellow elders is not meeting the qualifications, or for some reason, you know, and that's why we removed... Basically, it just became really apparent that we had an elder whose ability to rightly divide the, the Word of God and to, and to preach, it just really became in question. And then we had, a, we had a deacon whose character really became questionable. And so both were removed. And like I say, it was extremely difficult. But we have to be able to... You know, we can't be like the people in the Far East who Andy dealt with, who just can't deal with people honestly and can't say to people what the, you know, we, we need to be, we need to be able to be fairly thick skinned people. I, we, in the West, we tend to be just as thin skinned as they are where, you know, people feel like they have to save face. But I, I've known this through the years. I am going to have to stand accountable before God for the condition of the church. And so if I see that somebody has made it into an office in the church and they're not qualified, then you know, you if you're going to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ who's bought these people with his blood, then you have to be willing to do the hard thing and so does the whole church. And so personally I'm not really up for the repeat vote. 
but I do think that <clears throat> I do think that yeah we do have to recognize that there is a time to remove people from from the place the position that they're in in the church and as hard as it can be We have three deacons. You know who they are? Tim and Sam. And uh, and I'm the only elder in the church. And, you know, that I think that if we're honest with Scripture, anywhere where we see overseers, I, I think this that any honest evaluation of the New Testament overseers are the same thing as pastors, same thing as elders. It's just three way of describing the same people. Overseer, that basically gives you an idea of their responsibility. Elder, that just kind of gives you an idea of their spiritual maturity. When you think of pastor, well, you know, that's basically shepherd. That tells you something about what their spiritual gift is because Christ gives gifts to men and pastor is one of those. And so <clears throat> I think that those things are basically equivalent. Anywhere where you see a church, Philippi, Ephesus, anywhere where you see churches that have elders, there is a plurality. Any place where you kind of get the idea of a one-man show like Diotrephes, it's not set forth in a good light. So the ideal is to have elders. A church can be a church with no elders. It's ideal to have elders. It's, it's better to have one than none. It's best and most biblical to have a plurality. And so I'm keeping, I mean, one of the things when I came here two and a half years ago, it is to begin to watch. I mean, I'm watching. I'm watching all the time. I'm, I'm assessing where people are at, where they're at spiritually, what their spiritual gifts are. I, I'm watching. How involved are they? How faithful are they? Um, I'm constantly watching. But then I also have to have a sense of just, Where's the church at? You know, if all of a sudden three guys show up at my door and they say, brother, you know, we've been thinking, maybe you're thinking about some guy needs to be an elder in the church and we don't think he's ready to be an elder. Well, you know, I'm going to take that serious. And so I, I'm, list, I'm not only watching the individuals, I'm hearing what the church's perspective is on individuals in the church. You know, what is their thinking? And are, are people really beginning to see, hey, you know, it's one of the things that happens is if somebody becomes an elder, well, they, they've had the gift before the day you vote them into office. Somebody becomes a deacon, they've been functioning as one before they've been voted in. And what I expect is this. God's people are in God's word. God's people have God's spirit. God's people have a certain level of discernment, God's going to give them the ability and the discernment to be able to recognize when those gifts are given. Because those gifts are real. When Christ gives gifts to men, they're very real gifts. And that means that it's going to manifest itself. And I always expect God's people are going to be able to see that. Do I recognize that? Yes, it's possible. I'm going to have some lost people mixed in the church and their opinions are going to be kind of weird. Yes. Do I recognize you can get carnal people like some of the Corinthians or you get people that aren't in the best spiritual place? Yes. I recognize that. That's why I. That's why no single voice is, is going to allow me to not vote somebody in. No single voice is going to be uh, discourage me from not setting somebody forth for consideration. But, <clears throat> but if a, there's enough voices that are saying, well, we have these concerns. We don't think he's ready yet. We think he's immature in these areas. We, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm paying attention to all that. I'm watching. And then, you know, you, and, and I'm praying. 
Now, I'm praying for gifts, and so I, I expect that God's going to do that. He's going to help me to see, as well as the rest of the church. <coughs> and also when somebody maybe got into an office and they ought not to be there, that is not just going to become apparent to me, it's going to become apparent to others. I mean, look, one of the reasons I got to the place, I, I began to, I, I was kind of hasty in the first elder. I really wanted to not be the only elder. And so I kind of made a hasty decision in the second elder that we ever had at Grace. And almost immediately, I recognized I made a mistake. But the church just simply wasn't large enough. I mean, we know when there's two, it's kind of one guy against the other guy. And <clears throat> I, what I had to do was I just I was biding my time. I waited till the church grew and it grew and it grew, and we had sufficient men in the church where a number of the men would say, "Brother, uh, he's not qualified. He's there's there's problems there, and then you know he really needs to step down or." And then, and then it was time to do it. But I can tell you this, far easier never to put a man in an office than put him in and have to remove him. <laughs> that is, that's difficult. So that, it really, I, and thank the Lord. I mean, it just, the Lord allowed us tremendous unity through the removal of both of those men. Um, No, no vote. That was that was a that was a unilateral pastoral, uh, <clears throat> but it was done with lots of interaction and lots of counsel, and so. But yes, I mean the deacon. He actually, you know, I felt he was very beloved in the church and. I just felt like if if he was just removed, then that would really open the door for for possible disunity. So, so I sought the Lord over it. I thought I'm going to give him an opportunity to address the church. I felt like it was the wisest thing to do, and uh, it it worked out well because then I was able to come up afterward and kind of put everything in a proper thinking and then people had a good feel for what the issues were and uh, but no no in when it can't, comes to removal it's a, it's a, almost like presenting a, a man in the beginning i'm not going to present a man unless i know he's qualified and that doesn't that's not even up for vote I mean, when it comes to elders, I'm only going to set the man forward, or the elders are only going to set the man forward if they, knowing what they know about scriptural qualifications, knowing what they know about this man's, uh, his, his integrity and his ability to teach, only then would they set him forth before the church. They're going to make that decision not by vote, maybe with interaction from the church, but the same thing in a removal. It's like if the if the existing elders recognize that they've got somebody not qualified, then it really doesn't need to come up for a vote. There's 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 a responsibility there to to remove him. And obviously, you want to do it in a way that is most conducive. One of the things about really difficult decisions in the church, one of the things that I just you know I felt the weight of on my shoulders. When I was confronted by something massive, how to do this in order to protect the church as much as possible? How to protect the unity of the church in doing this? It's very difficult, especially when you got a bunch of people in the church that love that deacon, and now you're going to remove him. I mean, you recognize this, this could split the church. God blessed us. In 20 years, never having, I mean, we had we had an occasion where we might have, I, I think, 
I, I think twice we had three families leave over certain issues. But as far as, as you know, a massive church split, oh, thank the Lord, he, he preserved us from that. Anyway, I'm sure it's past 8.30. 8.27, so we got three minutes. Any last questions, comments, or any other sort of input observations? Lawrence, what do you got back there? The time frame? Well, when I say hasty, it wasn't so much the time frame. That was the issue. The hastiness came about in this. I wanted a fellow elder. I really believed the biblical example was a plurality of elders. I did not want to be a sole pastor. I did not believe that that was the best. I didn't believe that was a good situation. I didn't believe that was the most healthy for the church. I knew a guy. He was a friend. He was at another church. And his gifts had not been adequately tested. He had been ordained in another church. He had taught in another church. One of the, one of the very valuable lessons that I learned, never, 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 ever, ever, ever accept another church's ordination and another church's assessment of a man's spiritual gifts and integrity. You need to do it yourself. Your church needs to do it if he's going to be a leader in your church. I learned that valuable lesson. Because I basically took, I took his qualifications based on the examination of other men. And that's where my hastiness was. And then... I just kind of, you know, I knew the guy. I loved the guy. We were in the inner city. I just, just seemed to like it was such a good combination. He had a burden for it. He came over. I put him on the fast track into eldership. And uh, the, people, the people kind of jumped on board. Not because they knew his qualifications. They jumped on board because I wanted it. And then when he was an elder, I kind of split all the responsibilities 50-50. 50% teaching and preaching. Divide it down the middle. Divide the counseling down the middle. And almost right away I knew we had a problem. And that's when Paul Washer came and he did his first conference with us. And I explained to him. He said, brother, you did all that in the flesh. <laughs> I said, I know, I know I did. He said, you weren't guided by the Spirit. And he said, you made those decisions about like 50 per, like you did this 50% thing. He said, that was all carnal. Like you weren't being guided by the Spirit. And it's like, you know, I know. But you learn. I learned. <clears throat> The primary issue was the teaching. I mean, almost immediately, I thought, he doesn't have the gift. And, you know, even though he'd been preaching in another church. And then what happened, it got to the place, especially as the church grew, he just said things from the pulpit that were just wrong. Like he was saying, more and more he was saying error. Like I love the guy. He's a great guy. But 
you know, John Seisma came to me and he said, Brother, God is filling this church full of young people. You can't have a guy standing in the pulpit teaching error. And I mean on fundamental things. Like it got scary to where like somebody asked him in a some kind of Q&A session like to define the difference between regeneration and sanctification. And it was, I mean, he was just wrong. And I, I mean, just like a text, the one time Jesus teaches on justification, he got up there and just totally, like, it was so wrong. And I mean, it's, the thing is, it's not just knee-jerk reaction, remove. Oh, I had sit-down meetings with him. And, you know, even, even with the existing elders at GCC, you know, if, if at times something just isn't, if it's just way off base, I mean, there can be, a, there's a lot of things where it's like, well, I don't agree with that thing he just said there, but you know, you know, good men differ on that, or it's just like, I, I don't think he interpreted that right. I mean, that's one thing, but when it becomes something massive, something major, um, you know, I, I always felt like there was a responsibility to sit down and go through the thing. And so I, I had sit down discussions and finally I just, it's like, brother, I mean, you totally preached that text wrong. And he admitted it. I mean, he, he didn't deny it. But in the end, it's just like, I mean, it was step by step. I had to say, you know, I, I, what I was doing was I was curtailing his preaching more and more and more and more. So finally, it was like, brother, I'm not wanting to remove you from the eldership, but you can't. You can't teach here anymore. Like, you just, you can't. And the men in the church, I mean, they're, the, the church knew it. And so when the action, when he basically said, well, if I can't, then I'm leaving. I'm going to go start a church somewhere else. So it's not like half the church jumped on the bandwagon and went with him. But anyway, it's uh, it's a very serious thing. Well, anything else? Probably that was one question. I had another Hello? one. Hello, can, um, can you hear me? Yep, we hear you. Um, I, I was just wondering, maybe that's a question in, for another time. But uh, since we are on that topic, uh, what do you think? Uh, biblically, of course. So, uh, what do you think about uh, the practice that many churches have uh, of, you know, kind of putting a job offer almost uh, out there for, you know, well, we're looking for a pastor, and then and then someone uh, just out of, you know, the other side of the world or, or just any anywhere really just uh, applied, you know, because he's been to seminary, he's been to this, this, that, and the other. He got a CV basically and and uh, applies and. And has an interview and that kind of thing. Oh yeah, I think it's horrible because I mean, look, you got Titus and you got First Timothy that that basically spell out the qualifications. Do you you do recognize the only qualification that has to do with a man's spiritual gifts? It's one he has to be able to teach. Every other qualification is moral. I mean, when a man comes to your church and preaches, all you get to see is whether he's got that one qualification where he's got an aptness to teach. You have no idea. Of course, the guy's going to smile when he comes. Of course, he's not going to beat his kids and hit them upside the head and beat his wife in front of you. Of course, he's not going to do that. The guy's interviewing for a job. He wouldn't do that any more than anybody here, any of the men in the church are going to go to an interview and they're going to have their tie on backwards and have big old stains all over their shirt. I mean, everybody's going to put their best foot forward. And so 
For a church to do that, we ought not to be surprised why there's so many scandals in churches when, when that's, and sadly, that is very often, guys go to seminary and it's like, that's it. They're qualified. Seminary does not qualify a guy. In fact, seminary can only really help a man hone that one spiritual gift of being able to rightly divide the truth and, and, and aptly teach it. But you know what? Most seminaries are not interested in the moral qualifications of the students that are coming through. And so uh, as long as they pass the tests and they get grades in, in their classes, and you know, then what happens? Well, they get their degree and then they send out their resumes. And usually it's going to be, you know, why are they going to get hired? Well, do they have a personality? And when they stand up and preach, does everybody fall asleep or is it fairly exciting? I mean, that's why guys get jobs. And this idea, you know, of guys sending out resumes is, uh, that's, that's a surefire way for churches to end up with disqualified men. I mean, you, the, the idea is, how do you even know whether how a man is doing with his family, with his wife, in his marriage, his integrity, how he ha handles money, whether he's faithful or not? How do you even know that? I mean, if a guy can't handle his family, he can't handle the church. And so how does anybody know that? Well, there's only one way to know that. You have to walk with and talk with a man over an extended period of time to know that. And so the assumption is in the qualifications, 1 Timothy and Titus, that it is going to be in the corporate community of God's people where men are going to be fleshed out as to whether they're qualified or not. And, and uh, you know, the, the fact is that Grace Fellowship Manchester was reaching out to Grace Community Church, where I was already an elder among five elders and among a church that had been able to test my qualifications for 20 years. But, it, but in, in, to some degree, the church here really went out on a limb. Now, I know the church was in a, in a tough spot, but they, they kind of went out on the limb in, uh, in reaching out to me because, you know, you hope, based on the testimony of GCC, that everything's going to work out okay. But because, because I was never tested here firsthand, it does, you know, it does make it subject to... Now, I'm, I'm here on a religious workers visa, so in, in one sense... I am in that place where I have to be voted on repeatedly. And, and so if it, you know, if I came over here and you guys are all unhappy with me, well, when my visa runs out, you can all tell me to hit the American shores again. And so in, in one way, I'm, I'm kind of a little different, but, but, you know, it, church wants to be responsible, especially when it comes to leaders. And you know, the same guys that are out there uh, auditioning, basically, from one church to another, they get out of seminary, and, uh, and you know what? It can be good seminaries. It, it, you know, bad guys can come out of good seminaries. And uh, it's just uh, really important that we know the men that we're putting into leadership and, you know, in so much of the world, that, like I understand the average, the average in the United States of America, uh, it's, it's the same average a pastor is in a church that, you know, typical engineer holds a job or typical nurse holds a job. They're typically in a place for three years on average. That's, that's about the average for pastors. I think churches really ought to be geared to finding pastors like, Jeff Thomas, who stay in one place for 52 years. Men like John MacArthur, who stay for long extended periods of time. 
not these fly-by-night guys that are there for three years and off they go. I can remember that we sent a group of guys up to John Piper's conference and they were basically, it was a pastor's conference and uh, you'd, you'd have at lunch, they had round tables and you could fit 10 guys. I think like six, I think eight of the guys were from our church and two of the guys were masters. Uh, they were master seminary grads and they, these two grads, they sat over there just complaining, complaining. They had graduated from seminary not too long before. And I know this is not necessarily characteristic of everybody that comes out of master seminary. Undoubtedly, they produce good men. But, you know, these two guys are just complaining and on and on and on. They're complaining about their churches and the condition and how small they are just as though they should have gotten bigger churches. And you can tell they weren't committed to the church. Finally, one of our guys just, just invaded their conversation and just said, you guys are hirelings. Well, that's exactly right. And so, you know, we just, we, we want to do everything. We, we want to be biblical so that we avoid getting guys like that in the church.